Good morning, everyone. I think it's about uh, three minutes past the hour, so I think we're uh, due to start because we have a lot of uh, interesting material to, to, to cover today. Um, welcome to this webinar uh, on uh, artificial intelligence, uh, fundamental rights, ethics, and data protection. That has very many topics, uh, a very interesting combination uh, of, uh, of words, an interesting combination of, of topics to handle. Um, a fascinating topic uh, to deal with in general, and a very hot topic as well. Um, but I'm sure it's the same in, in all of our respective countries. You know, in the chat, we have many countries represented again. That's always fun to see. It's a hot topic in many countries, and the newspapers have new artificial intelligence news to write about every day. So I think it's a good time to um, have a webinar and to uh, teach everybody a little bit about the topic and what's going on and how people are handling fundamental rights uh, in uh, artificial intelligence. Very short introduction from my side. My name is Hans Schroer. I'll be the moderator today. I'm a lawyer at a law firm called uh, Timelex and part of the team that's uh, supporting the European Commission and the Data Europa Academy. Um, I know that many of you are frequent uh, attendees of these webinars, so most of you will be, will be familiar with the concept. Uh, the webinars are basically a uh, way in which the Data Europa Academy intends to increase knowledge and understanding of, of hot topics, um, new policy trends, new legislation, emerging problems and emerging solutions as well in uh, the uh, open data ecosystem and the data economy in general. Artificial intelligence, of course, has to be covered there as well since it's one of the um, hot topics uh, of the year. And um, since also um, we have new legislation coming up, we have the uh, AI Act uh, that will be um, uh, adopted uh, in, uh, in the course of the year. So that's something that we need to, to be prepared for as well. With that in mind, uh, the European Data Portal, uh, the European the Data Europa Academy has a series of webinars um, on artificial intelligence uh, in, uh, over the, the, the past week. And the next week as well, we had a session last week about artificial intelligence and intellectual property rights. Today, we are dealing with fundamental rights, ethics, and data protection. And next week, we'll have a session on um, the uh, AI Act. A couple of very practical rules for the webinar. Um, as you know, these are the same rules as always. The webinar uh, will be recorded. Uh, so uh, the recording also will be made available afterwards. So every attendee will get copies of the slides and copies of the recording as well. So no need to take uh, screenshots or to write down uh, the, the statements here. You will get uh, copies. Um, there will be a Q&A session as always at the end of um, the presentations. So feel free to uh, post any questions that you have in the chat itself. I will be collecting them and we will uh, try to address all of them during the Q&A session uh, at uh, the end. So we will not stop for questions during the presentations or have them immediately afterwards. We'll have them in a joint uh, session uh, at uh, the end. And also at the end of the session, you'll see a slide with a QR code uh, where you can um, provide us with feedback on whether you like the session, disliked it, and what else you would like us to talk about in the future. And we use that, of course, uh, to help improve the program and make sure that it's relevant uh, for you in uh, the future. We have two great speakers uh, lined up for you today. You'll see them uh, already uh, visible, uh, Peter Hanze and Magdalena Gatnovak. Uh, Peter is uh, a, um, uh, the head of uh, data IT and technology with uh, Spirit Legal, uh, a German, I was going to say law firm, but that's probably too narrow. I think Peter can explain what's, it, there's more consultancy involved than legal aspects, which is great for these sessions as well. He's a specialist, he's a fantastic speaker and a specialist in uh, IT and technology law, data protection and litigation, and does a lot of work uh, recently around um, advertising, machine learning, and ethics of automated decision-making systems, including uh, AI accountability. So he's exactly the right person uh, for this uh, session. Welcome, Peter. Um, we also have with us uh, Magdalena Gatnovak. I think I'm allowed to say Maggie still. Maggie is a colleague uh, of mine. She's also a very experienced legal professional, a strong background in data protection, cybersecurity, and intellectual property rights. And also, and perhaps mainly for this session, she's also done tremendous work over the past couple of years on EU funded Horizon projects, so cutting edge research projects um, on artificial intelligence and healthcare. She's a, a, a lawyer at the Bar of New York at the Warsaw Bar uh, Association, very experienced, and will be presenting uh, us with her experiences on fundamental rights as well. So um, I think this is going to be uh, an, an excellent session. So this is more or less the structure that we have for you. Um, I'll, I'll wrap up my uh, quick introduction shortly, and we'll have first uh, a presentation 
computer on uh, code and conscience, and then uh, a look uh, at the more uh, uh, the fundamental rights aspects, fundamental rights challenges of artificial intelligence uh, usage uh, by uh, by Maggie. I think it's going to be a very important uh, session, a very um, a, a very relevant one for us. Um, the Data Europa portal focuses a lot on making data openly available for reuse because we all know and we all know understand that there are tremendous benefits to be gained there on uh, by using data more systematically to make rational decisions. Um, artificial intelligence is a great tool for that as well. And um, let's not kid ourselves, both the private sector and the public sector already extensively relies on artificial intelligence. Most member states probably, when you file your taxes, uh, you used to be unlucky if you got audited. There's not much luck involved in there anymore. Artificial intelligence will help the tax administrations to screen your data, to look for anom anomalies, suspicious behaviors, and pick you out for uh, audits. And this is one of the ways in which artificial intelligence is applied uh, to data, which is a good thing, as you say, because it's more effective, it's more efficient, and it's also more rational. There's a search for suspicious patterns, and that seems seems um, at first sight to be perfectly equal and perfectly reasonable, good usage of artificial intelligence. But I think most of us will also know that there are some risks involved in those kinds of, of use cases and using artificial intelligence to single out individuals because that's what's happening for um, extensive screening. Um, one of the problems is that the artificial intelligence is trained on historic data. So it might be able to pick up um, historic abuse patterns very well. It might be much less efficient at picking up new uh, abuse patterns, new mistakes, new fraud patterns. So there is a risk that's being introduced there uh, for under selection. There's also a risk for over uh, selection and some member states have, has, have had to face some challenges there where um, selection factors were determined uh, historically by civil servants nowadays by artificial intelligence that for instance, target certain population groups excessively and they'll be disadvantaged, com disadvantaged compared to their peers because their artificial intelligence determined, for instance, that their nationality was a suspicious factor and made it more likely for you to commit fraud. That's the kind of thing where as a society, we should say that should not be allowed. Your, 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 um, uh, your nationality, your race, I mean, your gender, those shouldn't be selection factors for being singled out. Those shouldn't be relevant decision-making factors. But when relying on artificial intelligence, you never know whether that's actually going to happen. And the message there is not artificial is bad and we should be scared. The message is, however, that there are um, known and unknown risks that we need to face. And this actually uh, is uh, what this uh, session is um, all about. This is basically a session that will talk a little bit about um, how artificial intelligence is already being used, how it is uh, working in practice, and what some of the um, ethics and fundamental rights challenges are and how we can help solve them. So we have two fantastic speakers. We have lots of material uh, to cover, so I'm immediately going to pass the floor uh, to uh, the first uh, first of them. Uh, Peter, I will give you the floor and you can uh, give us your perspectives on some of the main uh, challenges, risks, and opportunities that we, uh, that we see here today. Thanks. Uh, Peter, if you can hold for a moment, um, I think at least some people have some audio issues and I'm having an audio problem with you as well. I don't know. Yeah, I think I hope some people at least have heard the introduction that I did. Yes. OK, so some people at least have heard me, but not Peter yet. OK, intro was fine and hearable, apparently. Can you try again, Peter? No, we have no audio for you yet, apparently. Nothing yet, no. Peter is going to, yeah. To, uh, to... Okay, excellent. I, I reloaded the, the, the page in the, in the browser. Okay, better now? Yeah. Perfect now okay we can go ahead thank you very much sorry yeah um th uh, thank you again thanks hans uh good morning uh, bonjour good morning to everyone code and conscience um let's get started with artificial intelligence fundamental rights frontline <clears throat> um that's me 
I'm not going to bore you with uh, details, uh, but uh, one thing that might be interesting to know is that for six years I had the opportunity to serve on uh, the board of a research and development company, and that period really opened my eyes to the worlds of both technology and law, and uh, of course also uh, AI. But what is AI? Um, let's uh, have a closer look at that. Um, oldie but goodie. If it's written in Python, it's probably machine learning. If it's written in PowerPoint, it's probably AI. And that was before the GPT hype. It's a lighthearted way to say that the true technical depths of AI and machine learning is found in code and not in slides. Um, but again, uh, what is uh, what is AI? Let's disentangle the buzzwords uh, like matryoshka dolls. AI goes, goes far beyond chat GPT. We have machine learning with its deep and convolutional neural networks, then a tiny part uh, are the new kids on the block, the transformers, but there's more. Think of expert systems that mimic human decision-making, advanced robotics integrating sensory input and motor control and computer vision that interprets and acts on visual data. Also, reinforcement learning for dynamic decision-making and generative adversarial networks that can create new synthetic data. Each of these areas represents a unique and intricate aspect of the AI landscape. When we're talking about AI, we, can, we could be talking about predictive maintenance powered by machine learning. It's impressive because it can predict equipment failures before they occur. Or um, we can apply machine learning to decipher non-human communication. For instance, when mice and rats squeak, are they actually discussing ratatouille recipes? And can we create a whale chatbot using their ultrasound communication as training data? In my opinion, this is way more fascinating than, than human uh, natural language processing. Um, in early 2014, I was involved and in part of a team that developed a comparable system to the one here, uh, capable of predicting gender, age, IQ, and income from just a 30 second recording of swipe gestures and mouse movements with a almost 90% accuracy powered by an elegant machine learning model, primarily by using regression analysis. Um, if you're uh, into prank calls, uh, here's a heads up as far back as 2018, um, people were already able to create realistic faces from voice recordings using something called speech to face. And you can find the code for it on GitHub and play around with it at home. I like scientific papers that come with code. And uh, if you know, well, want to know how they did it, the researchers, they were using a, a deep neural network at CNN, trained on lots of online videos, maybe also yours. And the model learned to create images that capture things like age, gender, and ethnicity, all from audio recordings approximately uh, because uh, approximation is what machine learning is about. Um, Dynamic pricing is also AI, whether it's search pricing for services uh, like Uber driven by machine learning algorithms to assess factors such as demand or based on your screen resolution, GPS coordinates, like if you're standing in front of a Louis Vuitton shop, then you have to pay the price for being in such an expensive neighborhood. But there's also an evolving landscape of dynamic consumer credit pricing that intersects with your bank account activity and fairness expectations. Um, also, uh, AI, um, you could rely on the magic of machine learning to predict the odds of your car spontaneously combusting all thanks to Google Maps data. And that one is a very uh, recent one in 2022, a rather clever method of consumer surveillance came to light Amazon quite ingeniously eavesdropped on your conversations with Alexa, then auctioned off targeted ads based on what they inferred from your discussions about music, cars and sex toys to the highest bidder. Interestingly, this seemed to go unnoticed by most Europeans and also the DPAs so far. Um, yeah, isn't she charming? Um, Michal Kosinski, a US professor and the alleged mastermind behind the concept of political micro-targeting of Cambridge Analytica, he revealed that a model trained on images of everyday individuals can achieve remarkable feats such as predicting um, their political leanings with a 72% accuracy uh, rate. If this holds true, it's certainly impressive work, privacy aside. And last not least, uh, very recently, a question of life and death was solved. The authors of this paper say that human lives share structural similarity to language 
and uh, they exploit the similarity to examine the evolution and predictability of human lives based on detailed event sequences. But what is machine learning actually doing? I'm not going to bore you with details. Machine learning works by extracting patterns from large data sets, as we can see with spam filters. Also, that they are not perfect. Continuous learning is difficult. You may risk concept drift, data loss, skewed weights in your neural network. Theory is easy. Life is hard. And there are the new kids on the block. Um, lawyers are annoyed because nowadays everyone's got an LLM, but both LLMs and diffusion models are types of foundation models. That's a term describing models that others could build on top of for many different purposes. Like during the Middle Ages, when Bernard of Chartres said that their work was only possible because they were standing on the shoulders of giants such as uh, Platon and Aristoteles. Um, Machine learning explained how does it actually work or what is important to know about machine learning. Building ML systems isn't that difficult as you can see. Collecting, encoding, training, testing, deployment, all easy. Building a working system, not so much. 90% of the work goes into the last stages, testing, adjusting, hoping it will work somehow, making it market ready. But of course, engineering is uncool and we will not talk to much about it but if you're like as a takeaway from today's discussion next time you're at a dinner party and you need a conversation starter beyond weather talk consider asking the undoubtedly many experts there um, how they tackle the challenges of overfitting and memorization which are common issues even with neural networks overfitting refers to systems merely <clears throat> regurgitating training data instead of giving us new insights, which is difficult to distinguish, by the way. Transformers. Um, tran here they are, transformers. Um, it all started uh, quite a while ago, even though they are still hot, everyone loves them. But few read the paper that started the hype in 2017. Attention is all you need, referring to the self-attention mechanism in the transformer architecture. Um, I can't explain in detail today, I'm just an ordinary lawyer, but there are people who can. This paper here is cool. You can see that ChatGPT only eats tokens, not words, and stores them as vector embeddings, which are numbers, not words, and they disappear into the deep layers of this network, hopefully sorted in a semantic order that is helpful somehow. For the output of the system, the numbers get retranslated into words, and yay, here we go with ChatGPT answering all of life's questions. So far, so easy. Um, but the interpretation matters. So uh, what I appreciate about intelligent individuals like Stephen Wolfram is that their wisdom is kind of eternal. At least their quotes hold true for more than 30 days. So ChatGPT is merely pulling out some coherent thread of text from the statistics of conventional wisdom that it's accumulated. In simpler terms, ChatGPT is basically just picking and organizing sentences from the large collection of its training data. It's not a creative mind, it's a glorified next word predictor. So for lawyers important, or for the legal field important, is where does the data come from and how does the supply chain work? and which risks are involved. So you have four main options. You can write on the internet, you can do your own scraping, almost uh, useless now with 60% of the web being machine translated garbage and the rest is just garbage. So use a generative adversarial network and brew yourself a cup of synthetic data or use real paper and pay them uh, to get real data. Nah, no one does that, unfortunately. Um, so uh, training data is expensive. What you can do is you can uh, choose from uh, data sets that are available, for instance, on OpenML. Uh, you can find everything from credit risk data to blood transfusion classifiers, or you can have uh, the internet with everything, the common crawl data set, um, or you can just rely on copyrighted content. Uh, and ignore legal and moral restrictions because we need to break things and hope for forgiveness later. Um, or even uh, worse, uh, sometimes you just uh, use the whole internet as training data and then you keep wondering why uh, child sexual abuse material lands in your training data and 
uh, poisons your models. I know that's disgusting and there is a criminal investigation ongoing there into Stability AI and also uh, Lion. Um, this is definitely something to watch. But again, where does the data actually go? Um, that's also very interesting. And uh, these models, the LLMs and diffusion models, they seem to work and store data in mysterious ways, a bit blurry, but um, sometimes not so blurry, as we can see uh, with this plain text from New York Times articles or um, this uh, song from Katy Perry, which upset universal music groups doing Anthropic because of this, or uh, we can have these uh, blockbuster movie stills uh, that are being created by Midjourney even when not specifically prompted. And uh, what is all of this about and what does it have to do with fundamental rights? We'll come to this uh, very soon. The topic is actually uh, quite simple. Large language models are like data compressors. They can store a lot of information very accurately, which allows them to hide mountains um, of training data in uh, relatively small models. People who aren't making big money with LLMs openly admit this, as seen in the statements from this in this paper from DeepMind, Meta AI, and INRIA researchers in mid 2023. And uh, it's called Language Modeling is Compression. And there's another cool paper. Uh, when they say compression is all there is. And uh, based on our latest study, says Yi Ma, one of the authors, uh, compression seems to be all there is in current AI systems, including GPT-4. So the specifics of how AI models keep information from their training data sets are not particularly crucial. It is often highlighted um, that these models don't retain precise images or text but this is a minor detail. What matters legally is that they hold onto the data in a form that enables them to reconstruct it effectively. And that's important for copyright and your data protection. Data protection, by the way, important point. Um, the, I, will, I will focus on a few topics and go a bit deeper and not um, stay with the bird view. So let me start with the training data. The current way of training models is basically that if you take GDPR seriously, a lot of the data is special category data, Article 9 GDPR, and it's used without explicit consent for processing in the form of scraping or further processing down the line, like putting it into the model and storing it there. And the CJU said that this is possibly not a good idea if you did not make the data manifestly public on the internet. So GDPR also has grown up and finally has the stamina to keep the bullies in check by imposing fines also for uh, loss of control over data. Uh, see the latest CGU decisions in uh, late December and also yesterday. And GB GDPR has also added a couple of new friends, namely the Collective Redress Directive that gives consumers the chance to unite and sue the hell out of companies that infringe data protection laws. Good news and enforcement, um, maybe bad news or difficult news for ML developers, but I'm a big fan and friend of developers. Let's focus on the positive side. Um, uh, let's focus on the positive side and I'll tell you, yes, we still can do something. Here you can see an overview of a couple of data protection principles. And uh, many of those principles seem to be at odds at first look. They seem to be at odds with machine learning. But the longer you work in the field, the clearer it gets that there are solutions. Federated learning, hyperparameter optimization, data, re data reduction. But all of this is laborious as hell, needs to be tested, and costs a lot of money. And as long as it is easier to do not nothing at all to comply with existing laws, we won't see any of these best practices applied in real life. Um, speaking of best practices, um, one of the most fascinating things with machine learning is that they can't basically unlearn and that um, is difficult for our right to be forgotten. There are papers, there is a machine unlearning challenge by, sponsored by Google, so a lot of research goes into this uh, direction. One thing that I found particularly interesting is one way to make models forget. It's a recent paper by Microsoft Research. They found a funny way <clears throat> to make models forget about Harry Potter without starting the training, the 
super expensive, complicated training all over again. What they did was a quite clever trick. They fine-tuned the model using a data set that had the original Harry Potter text as input, but replaced some of the names with more generic labels. So instead of Harry, they used Jack, and instead of Hermione, they used her. And essentially, they didn't really erase knowledge from the model. They just overwrote old information. Avada, Kedavra, copyright. Um, there are, and I have to speed up a bit, um, have to hurry up. Um, there are cool papers with code where you can test, for instance, experience the power to infer personal data from text. Here, uh, if you go to llm-privacy.org, uh, um, you can test this. It's a really cool game. And as I've already mentioned, I love papers with code. Um, in practice, and that's just an example from like a real life example, um, I tricked GPT into spitting out some uh, mean information about my colleagues and me by uploading this picture from our last year's visit to the, to the court. And it was indeed funny to see how GPT inferred age and race and a lot of uh, worse things just from the picture. A lot was plain wrong, but who cares about correctness if it's entertaining, right? Um, and by the way, you can trick GPT into doing that uh, by saying that the uploaded picture is not an image, a photo from today, but it's a painting from the future because uh, language models can be tricked into doing stuff. Um, that's also one of their funnier, the funnier things. Um, and now, um, um, I have to I have to ask myself: Are these genuine risks? Is this actually something we would have to care about on a on a more uh, fundamental rights level? Um, but um, I'm not entirely certain. The true risks often stem from a lack of awareness and an over reliance on technology as a solution for everything. So um, last week um, or in the last days in Davos, studies were presented on how many people will lose their jobs because of AI. Of course, board members are not at risk. And in 2023, um, the word hallucination was crowned word of the year. Um, I'm wondering what CEOs of this world had for breakfast to hallucinate AI as the grim reaper and like uh, cutting jobs. But um, that would require two things. One, we must understand hallucinations and we must understand the power, the real power of like uh, the hype AI at the moment. Um, I really like that quote from uh, Andre Carpathy. He was uh, an early starter with OpenAI, then he went to Tesla, and now he's back at OpenAI. And what he says, and that's uh, true, I think, um, that um, that's all they do, all these LLMs do, uh, is uh, basically dreaming and hallucinating. And it's only when the dreams go into uh, deemed factually incorrect territory that we label it as hallucinations. Um, whenever we don't agree with them. And that was just carpathy, um, but there are other uh, like experts in the field. One of them is Jan Lecun, a very bright person, far beyond conventional wisdom. He stated already in April 2023, um, these tools make stupid mistakes. They have no knowledge of the underlying reality. They have no common sense and can't plan their answer. Up to this point, it wasn't clear if he uh, referred to LLMs or CEOs, but it becomes clearer on the next slide. Um, so uh, those are his slides, not mine. Um, Autoregressive models are doomed. They cannot be made factual. We see this pi here symbolizes the infinite amount of possible token sequences from the prediction and the very thin line of correct answers. Getting a factually correct answer from an LLM is statistically improbable. And uh, the longer the answer, the higher the probability of getting dreams, not facts. But those models cannot be blamed. They work just fine because they have no concept of what is real and what is not. Um, we should like mark uh, this uh, part of the of the quotes from the slides of uh, Jan Lecun. Again, this is uh, important for longer outputs. The longer the answer, the more likely it is untrue. That leaves the question of why are these systems often correct? You might remember the two slides about overfitting and compression. It is highly likely, more than probable, that in most cases the LLMs don't work as planned. They don't generalize. They regurgitate compressed training data because they are intentionally overfitting on that training data. Um, 
And now there is more there is more research in this field. Stanford last week published a new study. Damn LLMs are really bad when it comes to factuality and case law. Well, not surprising given our knowledge about the tree of possible token sequences and the hallucination problem. And that's also when uh, they when they found that also in like the, the, the reasoning capabilities are very uh, limited. Um, measuring the precedential like precedence religion uh between cases it uh, means uh comparing the meaning of text they are doing really bad why because they don't know the meaning of a word they are not designed to know also um if you're still uh believing that gpt4 passed the bar exam no possibly not they redefined that into reality, uh, but uh, most of it was in the training data secretly helping the system cheat. There was an MIT grad student who uh, found that out in 2023. Cheers to students and their work. About risks arising from LLMs, what could possibly go wrong with regurgitating training data? We replicate biases as demonstrated here with example of uh, examples of a job posts um and uh, the us especially us judges early confronted with ai um they had their own uh, they have their say in this and they said in here uh, bradley star i'm quoting from bradley star i'm quoting from 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 the internet unfortunately while attorneys have to swear an oath to set aside their personal prejudices biases and beliefs to faithfully uphold the law and represent their clients General generative artificial intelligence is the product of programming devised by humans who did not have to swear such an oath. We should keep that in mind when we're talking about robo judges or other ideas in the field. Um, LLMs have an issue. Um, LLMs can't think. These models are primarily trained for predicting the next word in internet text. These models struggle, especially when the correct answer is a less common piece of text. LLMs hate edge cases and outliers, low probabilities, new things, but also simple math, as we can see in this interesting paper. Also, they can think logically, I told you before, trained on Olaf Scholz is the ninth chancellor of Germany. You ask them who was the ninth chancellor of Germany, they can't automatically answer that because they have no idea what a chancellor is, who Olaf Scholz is, or what a number means. Um, LLMs, and this is uh, a great paper by Melanie Mitchell, the uh, author of the great book AI, A Guide for Thinking Humans, said LLMs are not able to robustly form abstractions and reason about basic core concepts not previously seen in training data. Also more training data giving diminishing returns, so you can't train them with just vast amounts of data. Coming to the end, closing arguments, so to say. Um, there was another great paper uh, in the end of 2023, uh, which leads us back to the point of the CEOs and their trust in management consulting firms. When engineers tell you that manual fact-checking of model responses is super time-consuming and costly, then hiring LLMs instead of thinking humans is a recipe for disaster. What does that leave us with uh, our research into making um, AI safer and more secure and data protection compliant? There's an interesting and also challenging quote from Jan de Kuhn last week in Davos, LLMs cannot be fine-tuned to be safe. You can substitute safety with transparency or fairness. AI safety will not arrive by working on AI safety. It will arrive by working on better AI. Should we give up or invest our time in making this technology safer. I don't think, don't mitigate the output, build better infrastructure, because if you don't remove the cause of a headache, the symptoms, the symptoms will not go away easily. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Peter, for the the, the, the insights. So a couple of people pointed out in the chat, and you know, there's a lot, there's very good and very comprehensive slides, very good inputs on it. It went really fast because there's so much material to cover, but indeed everybody will get copies of the slides for your perusal, and so you will have access to the, the references as well. I want to thank you also, Peter, because it's um, one of the, the presentations that sort of gives a factual basis on what's happening and what isn't happening. And one of my favorite lessons from this kind of uh, presentation is 
hallucination is not a mistake that the artificial intelligence made. Hallucination is us noticing that something is going wrong in the content generation for the artificial. This is not a bug that, that needs to be programmed out of the artificial intelligence. It's the artificial intelligence doing whatever it always does, but us noticing that on some occasions there's a flaw. And um, I, you see it in the, 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 the fact, you know, if you ask a complex question, you can often get a very credible and very convincing sounding question. But I think this example, I think, wasn't on the slide, but I think it's another example that you once uh, showed, uh, showed me. Um, if you ask a chat GPT, everybody can try this at home. I've done this at parties and it's always great fun. If you ask chat GPT, uh, how many times the letter M appears in Canada? Everyone over here knows that the answer is zero. There's no M in Canada, there's an N in Canada, but no M. Uh, chat GPT will usually answer one. And if you ask, it, are you sure about that? It'll say, oh no, it's actually two. Because it knows statistically that if you ask how many times that this, this, this letter appear, nowhere, none of its training data does it ever happen that the answer is zero. It just doesn't come up. While it is a very simple factual question for us, the the large language models that we're using don't have any sense of um, of reality or fact or reason. It's just generating inputs on the basis of the available data, which doesn't mean that it's 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 a hopeless thing to work with. But there are some big um, constraints to work with. Um, and I also, um, at least I'm in the camp, but obviously I have an interest in this matter, that believes that lawyers will not be replaced or any other professions uh, by generative AI anytime soon, simply because you know it, it'll give you answers that sound plausible, but that might be very far remote from uh, reality. Anyway, so we have lots of, of other material to cover still, including just digging into a little bit the um, fundamental rights uh, angle. And at that point, I'm going to pass the floor to our uh, second uh, excellent speaker, uh, Maggie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hans. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Magdalena Gatnovak. To those of you who joined later um, today, um, today I will be continuing this very interesting uh, topic of artificial intelligence with the focus on the impact of artificial uh, intelligence use on fundamental rights. Um, I'm just not sure, Hans, I can't really... Um, navigate through the slides so maybe i'll do it this way this way it'll work sorry for that uh, so today my presentation uh will focus um as i said on the impact of ai on fundamental rights and without further ado um first things first what are fundamental rights everybody knows that fundamental rights are more or less uh, human rights uh when we talk about fundamental rights we refer to a set of legally protected inherent human rights that can encompass civil, economic, social dimensions. They're guaranteed to all individuals and they ensure um, our dignity, equality and freedom. Uh, to name a few, the right to liberty and security, the right to respect for private life and family life, the freedom of thought, conscious, uh, freedom of expression and information and so on and so forth. All of these are enshrined in various international human rights uh, instruments, treaties, declarations, conventions, such as Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, European Convention on Human Rights, but also in sector-specific secondary EU law, such as the EU Data Protection Act or EU uh, non-discrimination legislation. Also, member state national laws uh, apply. Um, fundamental rights are usually enshrined in uh, constitutions. So um, what are um, the implications of AI um, use on fundamental rights? So uh, when we think about it, um, AI-based technologies um, can be a tremendous force for good. They help us as a society, as humanity at large, overcome some of the most pressing the greatest challenges uh, of current times, but at the same time, they can have very negative, even catastrophic effects if they are deployed without due regard to um, their impact on human rights. And we have to acknowledge that AI and its use will always have effect on fundamental rights uh, in one way or the other, regardless of the field of application. And when I was thinking of um, those ways in which artificial intelligence use um, affects fundamental rights, I tried to focus on AI's capabilities. So what artificial intelligence, as it is now, as we know it, is capable of? And I came up with those four 
characteristics that can lead to fundamental rights concerns. First of all, um, AI is largely dependent on data. It has enhanced capacities to collect and process vast amounts of data. This gives it an increased power of human observation. It allows it to create very detailed profiles and in individuals. That data that artificial intelligence collects and processes oftentimes, if not in most cases, contains personal information. So if we don't protect that information, that data, that will raise all sorts of privacy concerns. Second of all, artificial intelligence, because the AI systems are connected and they can process those tremendous amounts of data, they can de-anonymize data sets that do not contain personal information per se. They can infer sensitive data from data that's seemingly non-sensitive. To give you an example, um, keyboard typing patterns or online activity can be used to infer individuals' emotional state. Um, location data, log activities can be used to infer sexual orientation, political preferences, even general health condition. Third, um, due to AI's self-learning capabilities and its increased autonomy, it is able to identify correlation patterns within data sets and generate solutions that go way beyond human comprehension. This may lead to artificial intelligence opaqueness uh, and may reduce its explainability. It is what we call the black box phenomenon. And this is particularly concerning in the context of automated decision making because this such lack of transparency deprives us individuals of the ability to understand, challenge, or appeal decisions that affect us and decisions that were made by AI systems. And fourth, uh, last but not least, AI systems may produce uh, discriminatory results. And this is what Hans talked about at the beginning, so I won't get into too much detail. Um, either way, in my presentation, I would like to focus on the right to privacy and the right to the protection of personal data, because I believe these are the two rights that are most vulnerable and most imperiled when it comes to AI utilization. Um, so just for like the sake of clarity, uh, what is right of privacy or the right to data protection? Uh, these are two terms, although related, they don't necessarily are interchangeable. Um, both are crucial components in upholding human dignity and autonomy. Uh, right to privacy is a slightly broader term. Um, it encompasses all sorts of rights, including the right to keep our private matters, activities, and personal information free from any unauthorized interference, either from the government or other entities. Whereas the right to the protection of personal data is just one of the aspects of this broad right to privacy. Uh, here you have the legal framework. I won't go through it because I already mentioned it earlier. Um, since in my daily work, I deal with the aspects of privacy in the context of health research, I thought I would focus on the healthcare sector to um, illustrate the risks and the, the impacts that use of AI can have um, on the right to privacy. Um, as many of you uh, probably noticed in the past years, the use of new technologies, also data-driven technologies, such as AI, has expanded, has been expanding exponentially, uh, mostly due to many, many advantages it brings about. First of all, uh, new technologies, also AI, uh, streamline, streamline tasks and processes, make them smoother. It improves efficiency, saves us time, money. It helps us in research. It alleviates the stress on both the physicians and the patients. To give you an example, with physic for physicians, AI-based um, solutions help them make decisions, um, diagnose diseases for patients. To give you an example, it allows us to um, use AI-based solutions for to replace very intrusive procedures, like for example, colonoscopy, 
replace it with procedures um, that are less intrusive and cause less discomfort. Like I mentioned, colonoscopy. Now we can swallow this pill equipped with a camera that will go through our gastrointestinal system without causing us much discomfort. So um, AI has been and new technologies have been successfully used in, in many areas. Um, recently, we've, noted, we've been noticing this trend to di digitize medical um, health records. Um, AI solutions uh, have been used to monitor health of the patients. Um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we've noticed this rapid growth of uh, digital consultation telemedicine. Under lockdown, we, we were consulting our physicians either over the phone or through various mobile applications. So uh, here I wanted, I, I created a list of this like four real life examples of how artificial intelligence can be deployed in healthcare. Um, maybe you've heard of those. If not, um, I included links to um, the website so that you can learn more about these applications. ADA, for example, it's an AI health application that can assess um, our symptoms and then provide us with guidance. So if there's something going on, it will suggest us to go see our physician or seek emergency care if there's a suspicion that we're um, having a heart attack, for example. EcoGo Pro is um, another AI-based system that can predict at a very early stage coronary artery disease. Cority, um, a software developed uh, by a Danish company, uh, which leverages machine learning to help emergency dispatchers make decisions. It basically allows to det or detect out of hospital um, cardiac arrest that occurred either in a public place or at home of the patient during an emergency call way faster than the human could because it listens to the call, it analyzes the tone of the voice, the symptom anal uh, anal analysis, and analyzes, sorry, <laughs> analyzes the uh, the symptoms, uh, the breathing pattern, and many other um, data. And finally, checks next. That's an algorithm that was um, developed by Stanford researchers, which allows to um, which can spot circa fourteen diseases among hundreds of chest rays uh, within seconds. Something that would take a radiologist about three hours uh, takes only 90 seconds for the algorithm. So um, coming back to um, the impact of AI applications um, in healthcare, um, as I already mentioned, AI is dependent on gathering large blocks of data. And that brings about a lot of concerns um, and has been highlighted during the COVID pandemic. Uh, with with many, um, it brings about many risks. Um, here I've listed five categories, five groups of risks um, most commonly um, associated with most common risks that are associated with the use of AI in healthcare. Uh, first, the risk of personal data being shared and used without the consent of the patient. Um, here I um, cite two cases. Um, which you might have heard of, DeepMind case um, that happened back in 2016 when uh, 1.6 million UK patient records were transferred without the patient's consent from the Royal Free NHS Foundation Trust to a company owned by Google uh, called DeepMind um, in the US. Uh, the data sharing uh, took place for the purpose of clinical safety testing of an application called Streams. Although that application wasn't AI-based, it it highlighted the the risks of um, the risks to, to data privacy uh, when developing technological solutions in healthcare. And in that case, the uh, supervisor is already in, in the UK, the Information Commissioner's Office, ruled that this was um, a blatant breach of data protection laws. There's a famous quote, um, the price of innovation does not need to be the erosion of fundamental privacy rights. And the more recent case 
is Project Nightingale, which is a partnership between Google and Ascension, the second largest healthcare system in the United States. Um, Ascension decided to improve its patient care. And so they decided to centralize their record keeping processes and move their data to uh, a cloud. So they decided to use Google Cloud Services. Google got access to over 50 million records uh, health records of patients um, of hospitals participating in Ascension Health System. Um, of course, that rose uh, a number of privacy concerns. Um, in 2019, um, a whistleblower came forward and, and accused um, Google of sh getting access to the or Ascension of disclosing that data to Google without either the healthcare professionals uh, knowing about it or the patient's um, consent. Also, um, Google was accused of giving access to this highly sensitive data to its employees. A uh, second group of risks um, associated with um, use of AI in healthcare is the risk of data repurposing. Maybe if you're familiar with the term function creep in the context of data processing, um, that's when data which was collected for one particular purpose is subsequently used for a different purpose, could be related, could be unrelated. And um, to illustrate this, um, a Singapore case, um, during the COVID pandemic, uh, like many other countries, Singapore rolled out um, its own COVID-19 uh, tracing app. Uh, it was a mobile app and a set of um, Bluetooth tags that could be carried in your purse or in your pocket. Um, at the beginning, the government assured that um, data collected by the app would not be used for any other purpose than for just tracking contact, tracing contact. Uh, after circa 80% of residents uh, downloaded the app, uh, the, pro the policy, uh, privacy policy was suddenly changed and the parliament announced that now this data will be used for criminal investigation purposes. So this is a stark example of how data collected for health related purposes is repurposed, subsequently used for non-health related ends. And um, here um, I'd like to note that um, repurposing can also happen within the same area, so to speak. So it can be, the, da the data, data could be used for entirely different purposes, but it also, also could be used for related purposes, like within the healthcare sphere itself. For example, data from the electronic health records could be used for like drug development or marketing analysis. Um, another uh, category of risks, uh, risk of data being exposed. And here I'd like to tell you about uh, the case of um, Sense AI. It's a New York based uh, company, a SaaS solution provider um, who experienced, well, it wasn't a, a data breach really. They accidentally left, it was more of a human error. Um, they left a temporary data storage repository accessible online. Uh, so for a very brief moment, uh, data of over 2.5 million car accident patients was available uh, to anyone in the world who basically had access to the internet. Um, fourth category of risks, risk of cyber attacks. AI systems are very vulnerable to cyber attacks. Uh, which can be not only burdensome, but very, very fatal. Um, a good example, Düsseldorf Hospital uh, University, uh, back in September of 2020, um, cyber uh, attackers hacked um, the university hospital system, rendering it inoperable as a result of which the hospital was unable to admit um, a patient in a life-threatening um condition and had to redirect her to a facility that was located 30 kilometers outside of Düsseldorf, as a result of which the patient died. The German police even launched an investigation, um, wanted to hold the um, hackers responsible for the death of the patient. I'm not sure how that played out. I don't think they were able to demonstrate the direct nexus, the direct link, because the patient already had uh, a life-threatening condition. But that goes to show 
on the real tangible physical threats of cyber attacks. Another example was the Electa study case um, in 2021. Swedish uh, radiology software company Electa was subject to ransomware attack, and that resulted in um, circa 170 healthcare systems in the United States being rendered um, being rendered inoperable. Uh, that resulted in the delayed cancer treatment to patients and the exposure of data of. Uh, of, of the patients. And another example, though not a real case scenario, but research has shown that AI controlled personal medical devices, such as, for example, insulin pumps, could be uh, susceptible to um, hacks. And, for example, could, you know, malicious actors could take over control um, over those uh, devices and, for example, administer excessive amounts of insulin, hurting the patients and not killing them. And the last category is the uh, risk of privacy breaches, breaches from highly sophisticated AI algorithms themselves. Um, I already mentioned that earlier. AI is capable to de-anonymize, re-identify data that's been stripped of all direct identifiers. Recent studies have shown that um, AI can be used to identify individuals and in health data repositories held by public and private organizations, even if the data in those repositories has been anonymized and scrubbed off all identifiers. So one study, for example, found that an algorithm could be used to re-identify almost 86% of adults and almost 70% of children in a physical activity cohort study, even though the data was aggregated and totally anonymized. Uh, 2018 study um, proved that data collected by ancestry companies, very popular in the United States, could be used to identify circa 60% of Americans of um, European um, ancestry. So what are the mitigating measures? How could we um, mitigate the, those risks, uh, what should we do to um, cure this situation? Um, there are a couple of those. Um, first of all, and I think first and foremost, we should keep ensuring awareness and understanding of data privacy and security risks. Um, we should emphasize the need to comply with applicable laws, data protection laws, now um, the upcoming AI Act. Um, I think Peter mentioned it, that uh, deployers, developers of AI are more focused on the innovation and they don't acknowledge the risks that go with it. Um, Giovanni Buttarelli, a late EDPS, um, once said, not everything that's possible should be legal and not everything that is legal should happen. So we should emphasize that, yeah, Technological innovation is important, but we need to acknowledge the risks that go with it, and we need to emphasize the compliance with the laws. Um, we should mandate organizations to um, deploy that deploy AI to conduct uh, something called fundamental rights impact assessment. That that's actually going to be compulsory under the upcoming AI Act for high risk um, AI systems. We should promote decentralized, federated approach to AI. We should advocate for the use of synthetic data. Synthetic meaning artificially generated, not related to a um, particular individual. Uh, we should continue research uh, that would enable us to improve AI system security and protect uh, AI models from cyber attacks. And uh, we should think of uh, coming up with new improved data protection and anonymization techniques given current re-identification threats. So what are the major takeaways from today's presentation? Um, new technologies hold immense potential for positive transformation. However, despite all of these advancements, uh, we need to remember that integration of AI can introduce a plethora of concerns and potential threats, particularly in the context of fundamental rights. 
Um, from the fundamental rights perspective, um, right to privacy and the right to the protection of one's personal data seems to be seem to be the most vulnerable rights. Um, we need to acknowledge that illegal collection, sharing, misuse of data by AI systems can have serious consequences. Therefore, we need to prioritize and protect data, data privacy. And for that, we're going to need to strike a delicate balance um, between technological in innovation and the preservation of our fundamental human rights. And um, maybe last and most importantly, um, securing, because safeguarding and securing data uh, privacy is a critical component in building trust in, in AI, we should um, give a lot of thought to it. Because if there's no safe, um, secure AI, there will be no trust in that AI. In, in that AI. And if there's no trust in AI, there will be no long-term success and acceptance. And hence, we're not going to be able to reap off benefits, both economic and social, and we won't be able to harness the potential of artificial intelligence. And that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maggie, for the uh, for the overview, and um, yeah, also for the the sort of the, the open discussion of of um, fundamental rights impacts. I think you know it's good that you mentioned the. Um, the e-health use cases, because this is an interesting one. Um, it's there, it's clear the use of artificial intelligence as a tool in healthcare is expected to create new health benefits, detect problems that maybe human doctors would be able uh, to miss. And of course, the um, the right to effective healthcare is also a European fundamental right. So while the concern on um, data protection and um, equality and, and discrimination, we should never um, overlook that point. There is also the beneficial impact on the fundamental right to healthcare that you do get with using artificial intelligence and the e-health industry. And that one, and I think this is just a very interesting one, um, uh, an interesting element to consider. Uh, about a month ago, uh, by coincidence, I needed to look at um, in the United States FDA approval of an artificial intelligence for clearance for to use it in, in a live uh, context and not a clinical trial, but actually uh, live usage. And uh, FDA, you have to show them studies to show that the artificial intelligence works. And what I found interesting, and I don't know if people are aware of this, and it's probably not universally true, but at least in this particular case, the yardstick that the that the that they use in the U.S. probably it's the same in Europe to determine whether the AI can be used is not whether it's better than experienced physicians, experienced doctors. It's whether it's actually already better than the most best competing alternative intelligence. So already in that particular field the test for whether something is acceptable, whether an artificial intelligence is acceptable, is not whether you exceed a human, because that's that's just the baseline. If you don't exceed the human, you're not even allowed to be used. It's whether you're better than uh, the most um, effective competing um, artificial intelligence. So that was an interesting one to me as well, to, to see that that um, is a criterion that seems to have slipped into to policy making that we're no longer even comparing in that particular field the benefits of artificial intelligence to what you would have without artificial intelligence, but you actually look at the benefits compared to another artificial intelligence that's probably um, uh, less effective. Anyway, with that said, I do want to open up uh, the, the uh, discussions the panels uh, to the panel here. Uh, we have a lot of, of um, uh, good questions in uh, the chat already. I want to try to start opening up with a, a, a couple of general ones that pick up a little bit on the themes of the presentations. Uh, I think maybe, Peter, I will start with yours. So um, you raised um, a lot of sort of, of uh, uh, doubts and questions and challenges about certain artificial intelligences, um, uh, large language models, generative AI in particular. Um, so the, the overall impression that you might get from that is very negative. Don't use this stuff because it's not as reliable as you might think. Do you think I think that probably is not a fair assessment of how you feel in general, but sort of what do you think are cases where you do feel that artificial intelligence or what are the constraints where you think that artificial intelligence could be used beneficially? If at all, the answer can also be, no, you got that exactly right. I don't think artificial intelligence is a good idea. Just, you know, push it aside a little bit. Uh, thank you, Hans. Um, great question. Um, do I have an answer? 
I'm trying to retrieve from my from my previous experience. So I've um, I have already experienced an AI winter. It was after um, someone at IBM thought it was a great idea to introduce Watson as a solution to all of life's problems, and in the end, it turned out to be like a nothing burger, uh, not in medical, uh, like in healthcare. Um, not in general planning capabilities, not in insurance companies. So that was really, really bad. And I'm afraid that when we overhype a certain type of technology, and it's just an infrastructure at the moment, uh, a good one for translations and definitely an interesting one, um, but it's, 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 it's not going to change the course of the world. There was a the study from, from the University of Cambridge for uh, the UK government, um, I think you remember we talked about that, that said like the, the, the innovations of the last 15 years had no discernible impact on the overall productivity uh, of the UK. You can substitute the UK with any other country, in at least in Europe. Um, so I'm thinking uh, that um, this type of generative AI is a tool. It's going to do a lot of good. It's going to do a lot of bad things too because of the like lazy way people apply it. Um, but in the end, there is a huge part of AI research and engineering that we don't see at the moment, but we still take it for granted because in our perception as humans, AI is everything that is not there yet. But the like the the automated sensor, light sensor in our cars that turns on the lights automatically when it gets dark, it's already AI. It's a sensor-based machine learning. Yeah, okay, not machine learning system, but it's a sensor-based decision system. We have algorithms everywhere, and we just have to understand. There is no shortcut to understanding. That's what I mean. GPT won't take over the part of trying to learn stuff, to understand stuff, and making decisions is hard because you will be held accountable for making a wrong decision. And um, that's why, um, of course, uh, it comes down to basics such as interpretable machine learning with Python, boring stuff, hard stuff, but unless you understand the challenges there, you cannot be a leader of such a transformative movement. Um, yeah, and also this requires to do this well, probably, I mean, either being an engineer or actually having a good knowledge of the underlying technology, because um, the thing is, you could ask a chat GPT already why it gives a certain answer, but again, that doesn't solve the problem because it will just say, okay, statistically, this is a plausible answer that I should be giving you, which might actually sound very convincing but isn't necessarily what's what's happening under the hood. And to me, this is one of the fascinating things. I think you mentioned the, the example of being able to override sort of ethical constraints built into um, generative AIs and large language models by saying things like, I think, uh, pretend you're writing a play and have the characters in the play explaining how to make bombs. Or you mentioned the example, oh, now uh, this is a painting from the future and now analyze what's, what's going on there. To me, that's a, a fascinating one that you can sort of trick um, trick further hallucinations in the artificial intelligence to make it ignore ethics and fundamental rights constraints that have been built in. If you say, like, make inferences about this picture, no. Uh, this is actually a painting from the future, and now make inferences, then somehow, yes. So it's it's like, in some ways, it's, it's like talking to a toddler that happens to be extremely eloquent, <laughs> which is a very fascinating process, I think. True. True. And that's where like policies for organizations or companies um, deploying these tools are quite important policies in terms of like um, giving people an understanding of how these things work, like the prompt sensitivity, like the, the correctness, I hate the term, but the correctness of the output heavily depends on the prompt. So between four and 90% uh, that the range, like it, it, it's really depending on what you type in, whether you guide the system with your prompt, but then still there's this amount of plausible hallucinations that you do not notice. So what would you do with, if, if, if a human did that, like a very plausible liar, that's toxic for your firm's culture. And now everyone is using like those GPT agents in their firm and thinking like they're, that's gonna be the competitive advantage. No, no, no. That's simple math. 
they won't be for many reasons. Sorry. But it's still cool technology, and there's a lot of stuff out there. For instance, the stuff that Magdalena told us about um, in like actually recognizing um, and infer uh, um, and making inferences about from from people's speech, natural speech processing, and inferring their um, state of health. But also, the uh, I mean, I'll, uh, it's it's a very interesting one because um, yeah, maybe we need to talk about that a little bit more. That sort of the e-health um, application cases because it's true. Like, if you had scans done, odds are very good that an artificial intelligence uh, looked at it um, already and is assisting the doctor. But it's like you said, it's these the artificial intelligence will make a recommendation explicitly say, look, this is decision supports. You're the doctor. That I'm an artificial, well, no, we'll not say that, but the terms and conditions will say that and say, um, you know, the, the, the doctor is, is supposed to decide. But it's still um, a, a big leap, I think, on, on the sort of the, the authority that we give to an artificial intelligence without a lot of, of transparency. Maybe, Maggie, I can, I can switch to you for that one now because you do, um, you support e health related projects uh, across the European Union. Um, some of those involve artificial intelligence usage in actual hospitals with actual patients and actual clinical data. What are sort of the, the processes and the, 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 the safeguards that are built in there? Because I can imagine that must be an uphill battle as well to go to a hospital and say, here's a new AI. We'd like to test that with your patients. Sort of like, what are the, the, the tools and the, the, the procedures that hospitals apply in, in those cases? Well, hospitals are very skeptical when it comes to sharing um, sensitive health related data of their patients. I mean, they eagerly participate in those research projects, but when it comes to actual data sharing, they're very skeptical because they're fully aware of the risk that that entails. So what we've noticed, what I've noticed recently um, is this trend to use this, uh, and I mentioned it, the decentralized federated AI approach. So in, set, in the context of data processing, um, hospitals are, of course, they're willing to give input data, so to speak, but they don't want that data to leave their premises. So uh, this decentralized federated um, approach to AI uh, proves very helpful because it basically um, entails distributing this uh, development and deployment of AI systems among multiple nodes, as they call it, so amongst multiple organizations, devices. So the computing power, the data, and the decision making are just distributed among multiple nodes. So basically what in our research projects, what we do is we kind of ingest the algorithms, the um, AI models in the hospital systems, and that's where the algorithms do the computing. Uh, the computation, and they kind of spit out the results and then send it to our centralized platform. So the data never leaves the hospitals. So it's, um, it's distributing the AI rather than centralizing the data, more or less, really. Yes. In the past, in our projects, we would like collect the data, store it in a centralized uh, database and train the algorithms within that centralized uh, base. Now, that's kind of being uh, replaced with this decentralized uh, federated approach, federated learning. This is actually, I mean, this is an interesting point, especially for this community, because, you know, we're, we're talking about artificial intelligence now, but, you know, this is organized in the context of the Data Europa portal. Um, the paradigm has been very much, you know, that um, data, specifically government data, should be openly available for reuse without limited restrictions, as few restrictions as possible yeah. to allow uh, sort of the optimization of the value. Um, there's actually that question there. I guess it's an open question for both of you, whether you feel that that's sort of a a, a, a risky approach in the AI-based context. It's, it's, if you're saying we're putting masses of data out there, and that also means that uh, it's available for scraping, it's available for reuse, and it can also be used to train um, artificial intelligence in, in, in ways that are unbounded. And um, yeah, I guess the underlying question is, do we need to be more careful with what data we put out there and that we make available? And with we in this particular case, I don't mean necessarily individual citizens, but I do mean large organizations and governance, governments. Do they need to have an, an AI-based policy? Because if you look at the example, Magda, that you just gave, where 
hospitals say, look, I'd like to keep my data central so that I can keep an eye on what's going on. It's very different from an open data context where you say just make it all openly available for reuse. Or even, you know, in Europe, we talk a lot about the, the potential of a European health data space where that data is also more uh, freely available for research. I guess, you know, this is sort of an open, an open question. Do you think that we need to be more careful about opening data up in the context of AI? Or is this something where we said, you know, we need some space for experimentation here, or it, it's not all that bad? I don't know if you have any particular thoughts on that. Maybe I'll go first. <laughs> um, I think in the context of healthcare, uh, we need to be very careful in what data uh, we're going to be putting out there. Um, in as much as I understand the trend to make data accessible and open with health related data, that's highly sensitive data that will never be able to be disclosed unless it's like synthetic data. But if we're dealing with personal data, um, for all the reasons that I talked about today, there's so many risks that go with data disclosure um, that I would be very, very careful with when it comes to sharing health-related data. And even in our projects, uh, the results of the research that the EU-funded uh, uh, research and innovation projects, uh, the results of that research will naturally be left for future generations, for future researchers. It will be open for them, but it will always be anonymized. It will never be like pure medical data related to concrete patients. So mm -hmm. in the if healthcare the context, oh, ahead, I'd be very scared. Yeah. You'd be skeptical, <laughs> but just open, open, if your doctor said, uh, okay, uh, Maggie, I need to look at this scan of yours. Is it okay if I use artificial intelligence? Presumably a doctor wouldn't ask, but if he said it's okay for you, or would you rather that I just look at it individually without the artificial intelligence? What would your answer be with what you know currently? If a doctor asked me if he could use a, an AI based solution to like yes. diagnose me, I realistically is not going to ask, but suppose that you gave you the choice and said, well, it depends on the patient's choice. If they want AI support, then we'll use it. If they say no, then we don't. If he's, would your... if he's, I think I would say yes, on condition that I'd be fully informed about how the, the solution works. And this is what we do even in, in our research, right? Uh, there are some ethics concerns. The patients need to be informed, fully informed about the research. So we need to explain it to them what AI-based solution we're using, how it works. It has to be explainable. Um, I guess I would still want to know whether it is the human who will ultimately make the decision and not the algorithm, because in as much as I believe in innovation and in AI, I still wouldn't want to be treated by artificial intelligence. I mean, same with like, I mean, I would like to refer back to the hallucination uh, point that you guys made earlier and Peter in his presentation. I can't forget this case in the US where a lawyer cited in front of the court case law that he was convinced that is true and, and supports his case. And then the court basically said this is made up this is not true ai basically generated some cases that were desired by the on, lawyer <laughs> yeah, desired by the lawyer exactly based on you know previous case law that that he was trained on it was trained on so oh, the, that was that was really the lawyer's fault though. i mean check your sources is a fundamental principle yeah and, uh, don't but, put I mean, too much trust in ai no, and also, but there is a sort of an, an, an inherent thing. There's there's a related question that actually wasn't about personal data, but I think that's an important one. Um, it was about use of AI for uh, fine tuning code and generating code, which is I think is an interesting one. So let's leave the personal data aside, but there actually is also fundamental rights impact. And I'm not a developer; I haven't written code in very many years now. Uh, but I have heard friends who are in IT development and in software development said. You can use artificial intelligence, basically ask 
the AI to write specific code for functionality for you. So if your prompts are specific enough, it'll spit out some code that might actually work straight away or will require only a limited amount of tinkering. And the same thing for um, testing for, for bugs or programming errors, asking an artificial intelligence to review your code and to fix it um, actually works reasonably well too. But there's also a fundamental rights aspect there because that means that if the code is generated by an artificial intelligence in a potentially sensitive context like healthcare or justice or just public administration in general, it does mean that you know the the, the risk of, of human checks disappear, and you know the ability for people to conduct these kinds of checks um, also kind of evaporates. And uh, people of also called uh, Peter, you're laughing, so I'm going to ask you to to justify the laughter in a moment. But people have also commented a couple of, on a couple of topics, like for um, information security for the hacking, that we say, look, we're kind of conflating things. What you're talking about now is a sloppy lawyer and a sloppy developer. That's actually not an AI issue. And if people get hacked, that can also happen outside of the context of AI. But still, introducing AI into this mix kind of incentivizes sloppiness. If I, I don't know. Maybe I'm phrasing it too negatively now. Peter, you have to explain now why you were laughing. <clears throat> Uh, so so many so many thoughts at the moment um i'm trying to with, with to go with the first one okay so what's new is one person alone can have like a, a couple a hundred models generating code at the same time so we are talking about generating rubbish code that's a risk rubbish code at speed at scale so um, that's a risk for information of any kind. Um, deep fake videos, uh, political misinformation, disinformation, but also, of course, uh, code. Uh, click workers are already using um, AI, generative AI, to do the work that was supposed to be done by humans at a very low uh, wage. So there are issues in this world already with generative AI that we will we will see how this turns out in one, two, three years. Um, I'd say coming back to the to the question whether I can use fine-tuned models like that that was the one that was GPT two uh, the copilot situation. So and it also regurgitated some of the trained code. It was trained on like the training data, uh, including API uh, access keys and. Uh, the, the 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 copyright uh, the copyright um, uh, remarks or the copyleft licenses whatever there was like it is it is a tool we have to be careful but of course you can also go on GitHub copy paste stuff and put it together and it's uh, it's already risky and maybe um, only Apache software but I had to take some time to think about the, the 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 previous question with the open data I was a big fan of open data for many years. At the moment, I'm not a big fan of putting your data online because it's going to be scraped, used for various purposes, sometimes against you. So if governments or the European Union are following an open data strategy, they should be aware of the fact that this data is going to be used to build fine-tuned models, specific models, that's the ideal uh, interpretation and those models are being resold, sold back to us as the as the um, as the uh, as the, those who are living in the European Union, and we have already paid for that data by in various ways. And uh, this is not a commercially viable way to to deal with data. We should put out licenses for commercial use. And we, maybe we should not put uh, that much data out because at the moment, um, all the governments lack the capabilities to do something meaningful with the data. They have been lacking that capability for decades, but it's getting worse. And <laughs> that's my that's my issue uh, that I have with, with this and type of Very data quickly, out. sort of a follow-up question. I think I know the answer just to check because there's also some comments here saying actually a big part of it is also that some of the data is, is rubbish and that if you have better data, higher quality data, more factually accurate data. References made here to fair standards also, you know, better metadata, better structured data so that AIs can interpret it more more correctly. Does that reduce the problem or do you say, well, no, that's actually not it. The issue is still just that 
you can't really control what's going to happen with this data and, and what kind of inferences are going to be made on that basis. Matalina? Um, I was reading the comments. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, okay. <laughs> then, 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 Hans, could you could you could you make it more more clear for me? I, I just uh, well, I think the question, question is no, because um, you know the sort of current situation is okay. There's a lot of open data out there, and mm -hmm. we can't really predict the the what AIs are going to do with that. So that's that's a bit dangerous. Is that problem solvable by having just higher standards for that data and saying, well, if the data is of better quality, then it might fix it? Or is this one of the areas? I think I, I don't remember the exact quote. We had one quote on the slide saying, look, actually, the data will perform worse the more data you feed it. It will get exponentially worse because it will just make weirder uh, inferences um, depending on, that on whether you give more data. That's L that's LLM specific, uh, not yes. AI specific, but mm -hmm. OK. But um, for LLMs specifically, a lot more data will give diminishing returns. Um, that's why you can't like build more data centers. It it it, it will still be confined by the architecture. Um, like very inefficient. Like LLMs are very inefficient. They're cool, but inefficient. So, but there is efficient ML, and that could use smart, well prepared, normalized data. Of course, that's that's a that's a that's a good thing. And of course, there are fields of research and engineering in AI that are in desperate need of high quality data and where GDPR definitely has some, some issues. I, it's, it's, GDPR is definitely kryptonite for that because if there is no anonymous data out there, like what could I do? I can only like, I could ask people directly for their consent, but consent is revocable. And unfortunately, the member states are not yet there to enact laws specifically using the opening clauses in 9.2 GDPR, uh, unfortunately. But so better data, good idea, but also like found like or, or, or um, subsidize an ecosystem that can help you do something meaningful with that data. Otherwise, you will just have data out there that is just worthless and this, outdated next year. Exactly. And this actually leads me sort of to, to a closing question because I'm aware that we're, we're sort of getting to the end of the session. So I just want to ask a closing session, a closing question, which is indeed, you know, what would be, you know, what, do we need further legislation or policy initiatives to protect the safeguard fundamental rights uh, on uh, against artificial intelligence? And I, I, any feedback on any of those is welcome. If you say, well, a, AI Act will do it. But that's actually a great answer because that's a good commercial for next week's uh, webinar. But also if there are other topics where you say, well, yes, in particular in healthcare or in the open data ecosystems, or like you said, um, specifically, you know, maybe setting up more incubators where you can have more controls. Anyway, I'll, I'll leave the floor to you both maybe to make sort of an, an observation from your side, whether you think new legislation or new policy initiatives would be use of, useful to manage or to mitigate fundamental rights concerns a bit. Um, maybe I'll... Maggie, I'll start with you, the ladies first in this case. Um, I don't think too much legislation is desirable because that will just hamper that the innovation. However, I do look forward to the EU AI Act because it's been in the pipe for so long that all other uh, world powers, such as, I don't know, China and the United States, they're already on it. Uh, President Biden's executive order uh, from last year, um, which was declared by the president, uh, the most important, the, the most extensive regulation on AI. Um, I think to, that in order for us to to be able to harness the potential of AI, we need to understand the risks that go with it. And we need to regulate it, not over-regulate it. So um, I'm not sure if more legislative um, kind of um, more, I don't think more legislation is needed, but we should finally um, have something in the form of AI Act, which will set clear boundaries and which will give us this uh, sense of security. At least I will feel um, more secure. <laughs> like knowing <laughs> that AI have... is placed on the market, undergo some sort of, or should, yes. so they're high risk, undergo some sort of screening. And exactly. It's not just, you know, to get because more thus out far, of 
Yeah, thus far we only had gu guidelines, right? The the white paper of the European Commission, the the guidelines of the, um, um, it was all thing. expert, yeah, expert group exactly. So thus far these were just guidelines that could or could not be followed. Now we're going to have strict boundaries, uh, strict rules. Every it will be clear to the AI developers and deployers. I mean, uh, many people were skeptical when GDPR came into force. I think that was a great move, and I look forward to the AI Act. Excellent. Peter, closing statements from your side. I agree with the GDPR. Um, it was, that was like a unique moment, and it's a unique product of a certain quality. But let's be honest, the AI Act is none of that. It's a mess. Um, the first experience with the New York anti-bias law, um, New York City anti-bias law, was that only 5% of the companies are compliant because they were allowed some discretion to self-certify. So they could self-define whether they fall under the act. Same mistake under the AI act. So we will have seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years of litigation after the CGAU until um, bigger players um, <clears throat> accept their responsibilities under the high-risk systems um, things under the AI. In my opinion, in the next six months, the Lina Khan-led FTC in the US will do more on AI enforcement and AI quality management than the EU AI Act will do in the next five years. Of course, that's a harsh prediction, but given their pace, on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, um, I, I, I think I would place my bet on the FTC rather than on the AI Act. Anyway, the main points are that we have technical standards being developed across the world. I, I myself helped like in a, at an early stage working on an IEEE standard on algorithmic bias considerations. There are many other standards, technical standards being developed. And in the end, like civil law might take uh, care of all the uh, the, the laziness, um, but in the end, and we will see how the recitals are being interpreted by the CJU. But cool, there's movement. There's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of consulting work, lawyer work, whatever uh, in this field, and it's gonna be interesting. Let's educate people. Let's work together. And I think indeed that's 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 sort of the, a good closing point. As I think you know, there's some some uh, comments in, in in the chat also about the importance of fundamental rights and having diversity and breadth on the um, the people who are helping to guide artificial intelligence. And I think that's indeed the main thing for fundamental rights. There's always an element of appreciation, but it's important that people ask these questions and come up with answers that they can defend and justify. Maybe they aren't the right ones, but at least it's important for questions to be asked. Uh, during development and when bringing things to the market and evaluating how it works. Uh, I think, you know, there's so much to learn on all sides. That's really the only way to, uh, to, to drive the rest of that is to have the diversity there of the skill sets that you need to be able to determine uh, fundamental rights impacts. We're going to have to wrap up the girls who already went a little bit over time, uh, but uh, I do want to thank, uh, first of all, uh, the speakers here were two fantastic speakers. Your slides were great. We have, you'll probably see that later on. We had lots of comments on, more than usual, even people asking whether they can please, please, please have a copy of the slides because you had so much also fantastic examples and cases on there. So yes, everybody will get them and also get the recording. So thank you for the great work and the great explanations. And thank you also to the audience uh, for the questions and the participation. Um, I mean, almost used to it by now, but having such an active audience is, is always great uh, for us as well. Um, you're probably tired of seeing it, but you have a QR code if you want to provide us with uh, feedback and suggestions for future sessions, that's always welcome. And finally, as a last word, um, uh, some pre uh, adv advertising that next week we have, will have a session, a webinar, specifically on the AI Act. So we'll see how the jury is uh, um, during that session, whether they're more optimistic uh, or more pessimistic about the potential uh, impacts. It's not a closed discussion yet, and we look forward to having it further with you. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you, Maggie. Thank Thanks. you, Peter. Thank you, audience. Uh, thank and you, we look everyone. forward to, uh, to seeing you again. Have a good weekend. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.